Well, good evening and a very warm welcome to you here at Norton Lane. It's wonderful to be gathered here at the end of the Lord's Day to worship our triune God again together. If you're joining us on YouTube, a very warm welcome to you. Everything you need for the service should be underneath the screen. Just scroll down in your... Oh no, that, that was this morning. This evening, everything you need for the service will appear on the screen. You don't even need to do any scrolling. All the words to the hymns and the Bible reading will appear in front of you. Just a few notices, a few notices uh, just for this week coming up. Um, we have next Sunday, Lord willing, I'll be preaching both uh, morning and evening. Uh, we'll be in person in the morning and on Zoom in the evening as we are now. Both will be live on YouTube, our YouTube channel, where you can find all our previous recordings and our midweeks as well. Just go on there, the same link every week. Uh, Tuesday, we have our coffee morning. That's uh, from 11 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock lunchtime. Again, I'll send that link out uh, later on this evening, just after this. Uh, Wednesday, we have our midweek Bible study and prayer meeting. That's uh, 7.45 on Zoom. We're on our final, um, final study in the Lord's Prayer. That's this Wednesday. Wednesday is also the Mums Bible Study at half past one on Zoom. And Friday you have Jam Club, which is our primary age group. That's at four o'clock on Zoom. And I'll send those emails out uh, early this week. On Friday also is our youth group, which is, uh, that is led by Michael Cochran, kind of for secondary age uh, children, which is uh, for, for teenagers in Wadden Road and, and Gloucester and Norton Lane as well. And they'll have Ladies Fellowship at 7.45 on Friday. That'll be on Zoom. And we're looking at chapter four of the book, The Envy of Eve. And that's our notices for this evening. Let's hear our call to worship, which comes from Psalm 24 this evening, verses one and two. The earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Let us pray together as we begin our worship this evening. O oh, great and almighty creator God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, God who is enthroned on high, the Lord, majestic in holiness, awesome in power, who is like you, our God, who can compare to you? For you are the most precious, the most wonderful God, the glorious and generous God. And we thank you that we can come and praise you and worship you and live dependent on you day by day. Help us now. Be pleased with our worship this evening. May it be for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us sing our first hymn together, as you'll see on the screen. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. God Almighty, three in one. That's right, Dave. That is the that, that's the right word. That's the right um, tune.
this evening as we pray together. Almighty and our gracious and most awesome God, you are the King and we come before you, we bow before you in worship and adoration, in total dependence on you for all things, for every breath, for all of life, and not just us alone, but we join with the angels, those in heaven, the saints in glory, the 24 elders, those who worship you. Holy, 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 they cry, they sing, is the Lord God Almighty. For not them alone, we join also with all creation. For the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims your handiwork. All creation sings your praises. And we join in that harmony, in that cosmic choir of celebration and joy to you, our great God and King, who rules, who generously provides everything we need day by day. We come to you our King who is good, who is loving, who is kind. And we do not come because we have impressed you in any way. We do not come because of anything new with our merit. But we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come united to him. We come as the bride, the blood-bought bride of Christ, the beloved. We come as your children. We come as those who have been cloaked in the righteousness of Christ, cleansed by the blood of Christ, in the power of your spirit. We come to you freely. We come to you happily and joyfully. We must come to you reverently. Yes, we come to our Father. We come to our Father who is the King of glory, who rules all things who is enthroned above the cherubim. Oh, we thank you and praise you. Please help us. Help us to seek you. Let all of our lives be directed to you. Let our hearts be retuned and recalibrated this evening, this day, that we might praise you in all that we say and think and do. In how we live and how we work may all be to your glory and to your praise, that we may walk and live together in a manner worthy of the gospel. That people may see our good works and not give glory to us, but give glory to you, our Father in heaven. Please be with us. Please enable us and enlarge our hearts that we might love you more. Give us wisdom to know how to walk in your ways. Teach us your ways, Lord, we pray. Do that this evening as we come to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to come to God's word now from Philippians chapter 4. I'm going to read from verses 14 to 20. 
Over the last few months, we've been doing a series. We had a break at Easter and at Christmas, going through Paul's letter to the Philippians. And we're now in the penultimate study, the penultimate section. Lord willing, next week we'll cover that final couple of verses. But this evening, let us read from Philippians 4. You'll see on your screen verses 14 to 20. Let us hear the word of God. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, before we come to consider that passage and portion of God's word together, we're going to pray for ourselves and others. Let's pray to our God together. Our dear Heavenly Father, We thank you that you know our needs even before we ask and that you know in your generosity and your love how to give good gifts, how to give and to meet our specific needs in the specific ways that we need. You know each and every one of us. You're a loving father who who knows your children well and you know how to provide for us as families, as individuals, as as churches. And so we pray. We pray for those who are ill in different ways, in different circumstances, in different conditions, and, and have different needs and requirements. Are we going through different worries at this time and under different treatment? Father, please be at work. Please provide the doctors and medical teams involved Um, with wisdom, with wisdom and understanding to know exactly how to treat, how to treat them. Father, we pray for Lynn Marie. Please put your hands upon her at this time and strengthen her and the rest of the family, Dion and Mia and Leah. We thank you for them. Be with them. Father, we pray for Sylvia and Christine. Please help them. Please put your arms upon them and bless Alan and Alan as they support them. Give them all the strength that they need. Pray for Courtney. Pray that he'll be able to get the appointments he needs soon. Thank you for the support of his family who live so close. We pray for him as he was out preaching this morning at Morton Chapel. Please continue to use him. Thank you for his love for you and love of serving you and of proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Please put your hands upon him and bless him. We pray for others, others who are known to us, others in our families who are unwell, who are struggling in in a variety of different ways at this time. Some maybe have just come on recently, others more long term. Father, we remember Stephen as well and Audrey. We pray that you give them a blessed and a wonderful holiday. Give them good rest and time together, refreshment. Please continue to be with Stephen in his treatment. Bless him, Lord, we pray. Father, please provide for those who are looking for work. We know this is a a tough time to find work when so many jobs have have closed and businesses have shut down. But you know exactly what they need. We pray that you will provide all of their needs. Father, we pray for our weekly groups. 
pray for those that involve children and, and young people. We pray for Catalyst. Thank you for Larry and Mandy and the work they do there and, and for their meeting on Saturday. We pray, we thank you that it was such a good time. Thank you for their studies. Thank you for their time of fellowship together. Please bless them. Thank you for youth group that's happening this Friday. Thank you for Michael and Laura and all who help and serve in, in that group. Please put your hands upon them and bless them. Use them. We thank you for Jam Club as well. Thank you for those youngsters and their love for learning more from your word. Father, we pray that you'll be with us this evening, not just with us, but with other gospel faithful preaching churches, not just in Gloucester and Cheltenham, but across this land, across this world. Yes, we may feel small sometimes, but we are part of the one body, the one church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we rejoice and praise where your word is being proclaimed anywhere from Mexico, Australia, even Russia, China, America. We thank you and praise you that this day multitudes are gathering to worship you, our great God. And we give you thanks. Help us now as we come to your word. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts to understand wonderful things, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. There are a few, a few different questions that if you're British, you don't like being asked. How much do you have? How much money do you have in the bank? How much savings do you have? How much do you earn? How much money do you give every month? They're not the kind of questions, as in other countries, other cultures, that's fine. And it's not because they're showing off or anything like that. They're just more open. But we, as, as British people, most of us, these are not the kind of things we talk about. It's the kind of things we worry about and we like to know about other people. But it's not the kind of things we like to talk about, is it? And yet, people in this country are very generous with their giving. Just a report just recently said that between January and June in 2020, the UK gave £5.4 billion to charity. That's just in six months. And what, what would that be like for the whole year? You think of the number of just national things that there are for, for giving, of raising money, children in need, comic relief, there was sports relief. Think of the number of Macmillan coffee mornings that have been held. Marathons, people raising money. People in this country are very generous. They're a nation who love to give, but they don't like to talk about it. Don't like to talk about the personal matters of finances and giving. But there are many reasons why people might give. There is a recent study that said there are three main reasons why people might give money to charity or to good causes. One of them, I think in this report, they were trying to persuade people to give more. One of them was happiness. You give money, it'll make you happier. It'll make you more self-fulfilled. You'll feel worth something more. You'll feel proud of yourself. Another main reason is that it will teach your children generosity. But what about Christians? What about Christians? The Bible is not silent on giving. Think of the Old Testament, giving a tithe. Jesus talked about it in the Sermon on the Mount. When you give. See, the Bible's not silent. And Paul here in this section, which I've, why I've, I've entitled this, um, sermon a study in Christian giving Paul is talking about giving isn't he that's one of the reasons why he's writing this letter to the Philippians 
You see, Epaphroditus has come to him, you see, in verse 18. I've received for payment and more. I'm well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Epaphroditus, who he's now, remember Paul is in prison, he's now sending Epaphroditus probably back with this letter to the Philippians. And one of the reasons he's writing to them is to say, thank you very much. Thank you for your generous gift, for your partnership in the gospel. We've seen another of the main reasons. He's writing because he's heard from Epaphroditus, who who has brought the gift, that there's disunity in the church. There's disunity in the church. And he's been covering that in the letter. And we're going to see how this issue and what Paul talks about here in this study in Christian giving, how that also relates to his kind of main purpose in the letter, which is unity. We're going to see how that fits in with giving later on. But there are a number of things that we need to say before we get into this passage, aren't there? One, as I've mentioned before, when it comes to giving, when it comes to giving a portion of our money that we've earned to the church, to, to good work, to missionary work, The Bible isn't silent about it. Jesus ish says when you do it, it's an expectation, it's a command. But then secondly, it's also something that we should not talk about a lot. It says when you don't let your right hand know what your left hand is doing. Do it in secret. That's right as well. But the third thing is, is that there's something to be thought about carefully. Something that maybe maybe you need to reassess at this time. As Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 about God loves a cheerful giver. Something we need to think about carefully. The reasons why we give. How much we give. What are we giving for? Why? All things to think about. What we're going to look at in this This almost this final section of Paul's letter to the Philippians. I don't want to just show us this evening from this portion, five things about Christian giving that Paul brings out in this study, in this final section. Firstly, giving is a partnership. Giving is a partnership. We see this in verses 14 to 16. You see, He says, yet it was kind of you to share in my troubles. In verse 15, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Now that word share and that word partnership come from the same word. The same word. And it's the same word Paul has used before at the beginning of his letter In chapter one, verse five, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. See, Paul is talking about that. Their giving is a sign of their partnership. They're partnering with him in the work of the gospel. They've entered into partnership with him. He says, doesn't he, that they were one of the only churches to do so. One of the only churches to enter into partnership with Paul, the missionary, the church planter. But what's really astonishing is that when did this partnership start? Was it after the church had been established for a couple of years? When the Christians there had grown in maturity and had learnt about things that they should be doing, like giving? No, it says in verse 15, you that you yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia. So in Acts 16, we have when Paul goes to Macedonia, Macedonia, that area of North Greece where Philippi is. That's what he's talking about. When he went to that region, when he went to Philippi and he wasn't there that long, when he went there, right at the very beginning, that's what he says again at the beginning of this letter. From the first day until now, chapter one, verse five, right of the beginning of their being established and set up as a church, the beginning of when 
Lydia, you remember, or the, or the Philippian jailer or the slave girl and others, just when they came to faith, they started giving. You see, when Christians give, it is not a, it should be, it can be a sign of their maturity, but also a sign of their Christianity. It's one of the basics of discipleship. It's probably one of the first things that Paul would have talked to them about after they'd become a Christian. One of the basics is entering into this gospel partnership, is supporting the work of others. And it's a partnership that's, that's both giving and receiving. You see what he says in verse 15. No church entered in the partnership me in, in, with me in giving and receiving except you only. See, the Philippians were giving generously financially to Paul. This letter is full of joy. He is very thankful for their support and their gift. That remember what we said last week. When Paul's in prison, the prison, the prison officers, they don't provide food and clothing or anything for Paul. The prisoners have to rely on care and support from family and friends on the outside. And so Paul is very thankful that the Lord is providing for him, even in his imprisonment from the Philippians. But in return, the Philippians are receiving spiritual nourishment. They're receiving ministry. They're receiving the fact that they are part of something bigger. They are enabling Paul to do the works of ministry. To be able to go to Thessalonica, to be able to go to Corinth and not have to work. Remember, Paul was a, a maker of tents and not have to work. But, but yet because he was supported by the Philippians, he was enabled to preach and teach and go door to door and do the works of ministry. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8 and 9, says what Paul, something about what he's talking about. Chapter 11, verse 8 and 9, it says, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them, the Macedonians, the Philippians, in order to serve you. And when I was with you and I was in need, I did not burden anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia, that's Philippi, supplied my needs. So I refrained and will refrain from burdening you in any way. You see, because of the support that the Philippians were giving Paul... It meant that he was not a burden to Corinth. He was not a burden to those in Thessalonica. He was able to do the works of ministry. They were in partnership with him. They gave, which meant he was able to be set apart for gospel ministry. It enabled Paul to go on to Thessalonica, which is just down the coast from Philippi, to go on to Corinth and then over to Athens. Like in the world of business today, a business partnership can be two equals who each contribute different things financially, who then share the responsibility and the burdens and the costs. That's what we have here with the Philippians with the Philippians who are partnering with Paul, who are supplying everything he needs for him to go off into different places where the gospel is needed and to preach and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. See, it's giving is a partnership. And this is totally the opposite, isn't it, of any kind of consumer culture Christianity. That you just go to church, you don't give anything, you just go to take, 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 to consume and not give or fulfill any kind of partnership in the gospel. As we'll see a bit later on, this partnership for the Philippians, it involved a cost, a great cost. It was sacrificial partnership. But it's, it's something that enables gospel ministry, enables missionary work. It provides for the needs of others. 
when Paul was writing to Timothy, Timothy, who Paul mentions here in chapter two, who's known to the Philippians. He says that a laborer deserves his wages. Paul was a laborer for the gospel. And he deserved his wages and was very thankful that the Philippians were entering into partnership with him. And not just recently, right from the beginning, when they first heard the good news of Jesus Christ. How do you see church? Do you see it as a, a free open buffet? Help yourself, take what you want. Or as a market? This involved of, of giving and receiving. Now we are in partnership together here. Church members, partners in, in, in works of giving and service to enable the works of ministry, to enable the spread of the gospel to Cheltenham and Leckhampton, to enable churches to be planted, missionaries to be sent and supported. Think of the work in Romania, Mangalia, to enable the children's work. And it's something we all need to review and to think about, as Paul talks about here. You need to think about, is church costly in this kind of way? Or am I just taking? And yes, we all go through different times and seasons in our life. But it's something we all need to think about. Being a Christian means being in partnership. It's what giving means. It means being in partnership, not just giving for the sake of it, but you are partnering in gospel work. Now, secondly, in this study of Christian giving, it is also for a profit. For a profit. Now, this here is talking about what Paul's attitude is as the receiver, his attitude to the givers, to the Philippians. See, Paul has been falsely accused probably of, of taking their gifts, squandering them, being greedy. We read about that in chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. Those who have come in, those opponents who are saying these false things about Paul, probably accusing Paul of being like a health and wealth pastor. Like you see maybe on the, the television or some documentaries, I think, about those ministers who arrive at church in big limousines and, and have their own private jets and a large mansion. But Paul here confirms, I am not asking for more. You see in verse 17, not that I seek the gift. I'm not giving you praise. I'm not writing this letter to say thank you so that you give me more. No, the reason I want to thank you, the reason that I'm joyful, is that I seek the fruit or the profit that increases to your account. I'm not thinking of what I can get out of you by just buttering you up by saying nice things. No, what I'm really excited about, says Paul, is what you gain, what it shows about you by your giving. See, in the Philippians, entering into partnership with Paul right from the beginning, it shows to Paul, and this is one of the reasons why he's so full of joy in this letter, it shows to Paul the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, giving them new life, a new heart, work of transformation. And Christian giving, it wasn't unique in this time in the Roman Empire. Philanthropy and charity were existing practices in the Roman Empire at the time, similar to today. Christians aren't the only ones who give. Think of comic relief or children in need. Lots of people give. Lots of people give for different causes, to alleviate the poor, to help those who are sick, to raise money for research into medical care and other causes very similar to the Roman Empire. But the difference here is the, what it shows about the Philippians' heart. That they're giving to Paul to enable him to minister and to preach the gospel, 
spreading the good news about Jesus Christ. It's evidence of their love for the Lord Jesus that they want to give sacrificially that more people might hear about him. It's evidence of their love for the lost, of those in Corinth and Thessalonica and Athens that Paul would go to. Their love for them in those other neighbouring cities. Wanting to see sinners saved and thinking, how can we do it? Let's support Paul. Let's support those that the Lord has called to ministry and to these different, to, to missionary work. That churches might be planted, that saints may be built up and edified. They're not just in, in interested in reducing earthly poverty. Paul didn't do that. They're interested in the spread of the good news of Jesus Christ. Not that earthly poverty is reduced, but that heavenly accounts can be opened. There's one commentator who said that this gift was like an investment which would pay rich dividends in the service of the kingdom. It would give a profit of spiritual blessing. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, they would seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. He was storing up treasure in heaven. Showing that their hearts were for God, were for the gospel. They were tuned to Christ and to his glory. We see the astonishing attitude of Paul that that's what he wants. Yes, he wants them to give, but not for the gift, but for what it says about the givers. He's more thankful and joyful about what their partnership, what their sacrificial giving says about the Philippians, about their love for Christ, about their love for the spread of the gospel and the salvation of sinners. That's something we need to ask ourselves, isn't it? Yes, sometimes we can set up a standing order or a direct debit and we can easily not think about our, our giving at all. But what is our motivation for giving? Is it just because we have to? Yes, it, can, it is a command. But is our motivation for the glory of Christ and for the growth of his church, for the salvation of the lost? We've seen the giving of this partnership involves a profit. There's also a pattern, a pattern. You see in verse 18, Paul says, I have received full payment and more and well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gift you sent. Listen to how he describes what this giving means, what it is. A fragrant offering a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. Now, what Paul is saying there at the beginning, I've received full payment, as if he's kind of handing, holding up his receipt or his, he's, he's received it, received it in full, and he's very thankful. But why does he talk, start talking about a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God? Yeah. Would you be thinking, well, Paul, that, that, that's got nothing to do with giving, hasn't it? This is talking about giving, fun, not giving a sacrifice. Well, what, what do you mean, Paul? Well, here is where he talks about what giving actually is, what it is. Because that language there, fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing God, comes straight out of the Old Testament. You find it in Genesis 8. 20 to 21 let's read just a, a couple of references and there are many times where it is referenced that language genesis 8 just after noah's ark 20 and 21 it says then noah built an altar to the lord and took some of every clean animal and some of every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar and then verse 21, and when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man. 
just another couple of references exodus 29 verse 18 this is after god has rescued his people brought them to mount sinai 29 18 says and burn the whole ram on the altar it is a burnt offering to the lord it is a pleasing aroma a food offering to the Lord. And there are other references where we could go to where it talks about an uh, offering or a sacrifice being in a pleasing aroma, a fragrant odor, a fragrant smell, a pleasing aroma, a pleasing and acceptable sacrifice to the Lord. Well, what, what's going on here? Well, what are those acts that we looked at just a, a few references? You can go to Leviticus 1 verse 9 or Ezekiel 40. But they're all acts of worship. They're all acts of worship. And the pattern that we see in the Old Testament is that worship is costly. You have to give of your own animals, your own rams, your own lambs to be burnt and sacrificed. But it is worship that pleased God, as we've just read on those few verses. It pleased God and it, it says to God, you are more worthy, more valuable, more important to me than my material possessions. That I'm willing to burn this as a sacrifice, as an offering to you, to show you my heart is for you. You are number one. I'm willing to give them up for you. It's worship that promotes and enables ministry as well, that priests could be provided for to tend to the tabernacle and the temple. And so Christian giving, Paul is saying, it follows in the same pattern as in the Old Testament worship. Christian giving follows the same pattern. It is both sacrificial, it is costly, and as Paul said, it is pleasing to the Lord. Not because of the actual amount that you give or, or what you're giving, but because it shows your heart. It shows that you're saying in giving, the Lord is more important. You are more valuable than these, these things. I thank you for them, but you are number one. You are most important. In Ephesians 5 verse 2, Paul uses exactly the same language here describing Christ. Ephesians 5 verse 2, Paul says, And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. He, in giving, we are being Christ-like. Christ sacrificed himself. We are sacrificing of ourselves and, and what we have in worship, in love. Paul taught in, the, in, in chapter 2 to be imitators of Christ, to have the same mind as Christ. It's a pattern. Our, worship, our, our giving is worship. It is Christ-like worship as we give of ourselves. Worship isn't just something we do on a Sunday with our voices or at church. The giving is how we live Monday to Saturday as well. It is how we use our money, our time and our resources. It is spiritual worship and it is something that is pleasing to God. We've had... The partnership in giving, a profit, the pattern. There's two more briefly just before we finish. There's a promise involved as well. A promise. You see in verse 19, and my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, I've mentioned a couple of times about the Philippians partnership with Paul being sacrificial, being costly. In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, we get a more of an insight into what that actually involved and what it mean, what it meant for them. So Paul writes, 
We want you to know, brothers, about the grace that God has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Remember, that's Philippi. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord. You see, the Philippians being in partnership and given to Paul was not they were just giving a few bits of loose change they found behind the sofa. No, it was it was sacrificial giving and it came at a great cost to them. Poverty, affliction. It was probably what was the cause of their anxieties in chapter four, verse six. Maybe the cause of Paul's trouble. Opponents coming and seeing the Philippians in their poverty saying, you're giving all this to Paul. He's living it up. What are you doing? Maybe a cause of their disunity. Maybe that's what the disagreement was about between Yodia and Syntyche. We've seen just recently on the news with, with the Prime Minister's flat how much um, disagreement and arguments can be brought up by money and costs. But in verse 19, Paul wants to assure them that as God has been God to me, my God, in 2.25, as he has supplied every need of mine. He will provide for you as well. He will provide for you as well. He provided for me even in prison. He will provide for you, yes, all the spiritual riches and blessings in Christ. Assurance, salvation, forgiveness, heavenly inheritance, adoption. But also for your present physical needs as well, as he has done so for me, as he has been God to me. Which that's why he says in verse 20, then to our God be glory. He will be God to you. It says, don't let your giving be controlled by what you have today. God can provide. Owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He can provide from all your needs. Don't let your giving be controlled by a, a thought of God that he has limited resources to give. That he is not generous. That what you have is all you're going to have. No, let your giving be generous because you have a generous God. And it's easy, isn't it, to value financial security and wisely so. Having savings, having a pension, there is wisdom. But don't do it in thinking that you need it just in case God doesn't provide for you. Just in case God fails and you need a kind of a backup. No, God is a generous God. He is a loving father who loves to give good gifts, to give to his children, to his people. To give not just small amounts, just like a scrap of bread, but to give abundantly. But it comes down to trust and to faith. Yes, this giving that we have agreed to is going to be costly. But do I believe that God is able and willing to supply my needs? Here we've seen the partnership, the prophet, the pattern, the promise. And finally, just verse 20, the praise that giving results in. See, for the Philippians, their partnership and their gift, Paul is is full of joy as we've seen throughout this letter and even now in just thinking in his in prison surrounded by darkness he can't help but praise God the God who he's just been thinking about the God who has provided for him the God who he knows will provide for the Philippians the God who is to be worshipped who is pleased he can't help but say to our God and Father to our God, my God, your God, and Heavenly Father, be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
the this is gospel logic we're thinking about what god has done the logical response is praise is worship is adoration in our studies in the lord's prayer is how we see the prayer end with doxology with praise to the god who can answer prayer to the god who can provide will provide and wants to and delights in providing Paul is a witness to this. Even in prison, he has everything he needs. He's saying to Philippians who are anxious, who are worried, do not be. Because this is who your God is, one who is worthy of praise, because you can be assured he is unchangeable. He is infinite, unlimited. He is loving and kind and generous. And he is your God. Because you are united to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he will never let you go. He is the God who gives daily. The God who gave his son. And will one day, when Jesus comes again, give all freedom from need and hunger and worry and anxiety and death and illness. To the praise of the glorious and generous God. In this study... In Christian giving it should not end with self-congratulations and pride, but all be to the praise and the glory of God. We've seen that it is a partnership, though spiritual profit is a pattern of worship. There's a promise of provision and all to the praise of God. And, and giving is something we need to think carefully about. That we that are the generosity of our giving should reflect the generosity of our heavenly father. Just to end, let me read this verse from Romans 8 verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We have a generous God. Let us pray together. Almighty and great God, we thank you that all good things come from you. We thank you that you provide us with our daily bread. Please help us to generously give for your glory as part of our worship, because it is pleasing and acceptable to you. That our hearts be tuned to the sound of Christ and of his excellences being proclaimed throughout this town and this world, that many more will come to faith in him. Be with us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. We are come to our, our final hymn now this evening. Immortal honours rest on Jesus head my god my portion and my living bread in him i live upon him cast my care he saves from death destruction and despair
People of God, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.